Revelation chapter 22 this morning. Revelation chapter 22. It's good to see you this morning. Good to have our visitors with us today. Home folks, regulars, it's good to see you today. We're all hopefully the children of God by our faith in Christ Jesus, of course. I emailed the bulletins this morning to as many as I could think of. I'm sure there were others. I can be emailed at any time. Uh, and that bulletin, uh, I don't think has my email address in it. Probably I could put it on there, but people who got the email from me can reply if they know someone else who might want to have uh, the bulletin sent to them. If they can't get out for services, I invite them as well as anyone else that wants to. We've still got room here with even with distancing with family or friend groups that know each other well enough to know that it's okay. And I have to always respect as a pastor and a leader in this church that I'm responsible for everyone here to a degree. And otherwise, y'all are responsible. I can't be a police officer, and I don't expect to be one. Uh, but uh, I do have uh, a legal responsibility, uh, like it or not, I still do. Whether you like that concept or not, I still do. So I have to observe that. And I understand that. I mean, we couldn't have just any kind of person just wire this building. It had to be licensed electrician to wire this. And when we had these lights put in, we had a person with that company that was licensed to run it to the main box. It wasn't just, you know, I got that. Stick your finger in the wrong hole back there and we'll be burying you out here in the yard somewhere. So we do have permits and licensing for certain things and there are certain responsibilities that I have. We have people in this church who have fiduciary responsibilities. And I have administrative responsibilities. That's why I am bonded in the state of Virginia. I have to be bonded that I'm not some sort of a Yahoo criminal. That I have... Uh, good standing with the state as well as is be expected. So those are there are things that I'm responsible for. So that's why I try to do things as best as we know how to do them. Appreciate all the uh, continued support in the church and faithfulness and all those who can come out. Uh, we are good to go and glad to have you. And uh, I'm going to ask you to turn, as I said, to the book of Revelation now, chapter 22, as we continue in our series, Heaven 2.0. Ten, twelve years ago, I taught a series on heaven, and we've learned some more things from Scripture, and I've studied even more in books, and perhaps you have as well. But also, I'm ten years older to get in there. It's like the trip to Oak Island my wife and I took just, you know, a week ago. You know, it's 300 and some miles down there, but as we got closer and closer, we got further and further away from 4248 Botetot Road, where we live, our address at the church house, the parsonage. And the more we traveled in that direction, the closer we got to our destination. You're doing the exact same thing with the years of your life. You are not stuck somewhere. You are traveling. In that direction as a believer, from the moment you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, your direction of your eternal destiny turned around. And you are that much closer than you were from the time that you believed. However long the Lord may grace you to physically bless our presence on this earth, or me, yours, you're still closer than you were. If you're a young person, and I know there's young people in here that are saved, born again, just as close to going to heaven as any of the rest of us, if the rapture should happen, uh, He's not going to let you stay here any longer. <laughs> you don't want to. You will be gone too. That's the Lord's plan, not ours. We don't dictate that plan. By our faith in Christ Jesus, we become a member of the royal family of God or the beloved, the agape toy as we're called. That's a wonderful thing. But we're closer 10 years into being in heaven than we were when I taught this 10 years ago or longer. I can't remember exactly when. <clears throat> but actually, we finished the study 
in the book of Lamentations, as sad of a book that was, it was time to talk about something that was awaiting us. And it is joyful, yet it's not all uh, just potato salad and fried chicken and a big party, though that may be a part of it. At that time, I don't know whether or not you will be going either to Food Line or Kroger's to pick it up. I'm not sure if they've got one of those there. I'm not, not sure if it's superfoods or whatever, or giant foods or what. Just being a bit facetious, but it will be perfect. We're going to talk about some of that today. So we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. This is one of those passages where you might as well, if you were in my shoes, throw up your hands. Because that's what you get when you get to a lot of commentaries in this passage of Scripture. Commentators who've got great degrees in Greek, both classical, koine, and attic degrees and understanding in all forms of Chaldean and Hebrew languages who are theologians to the greatest degree. Fifth belt theologians, I call them. Black belt, fifth degree in the theological world. And when they get to this passage of Scripture, uh looks like they left it up to uh, their grandchildren to figure it out. And that's okay, but their grandchildren are like two years old. Very few have much to say in this passage. And that's usually when it's best not to say too much. But the key is to have it in his right dispensational fix as it is in any passage. So at least I can do that. And that I will do. I've listened to our former pastor's lessons on this as well. There's only so much you can say. And you must then go on. And that's the way it is. We will all learn the exact truth, the exact way, in the sweet by and by when we get there. I think we can all say amen to that. But it's my job as a pastor teacher to do the best I can to present as honestly and as accurately as I can what the Word of God says. And that's my job. I'm not a ringmaster in a three-ring circus as a pastor. My job is not to entertain the troops. My job is not to make the Word of God seem easy, but just understandable. It's up to, that's between you and the Lord as it is with me. And we'll leave it up to that. But I entitled this lesson, God's Tree of Life. God's Tree of Life. Basics number 412, Heaven Lesson 17. And there's just a couple more lessons in this series left uh, for us before we'll go on to something other. Verse 20, chapter 22 and verse 1 of Revelation says, And He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bore twelve kinds of fruit and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There should be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him." Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this time of study, time of worship, time of reflection, and a time of, of looking into uh, the mirror, seeing ourselves, and in reflection, hoping to see You, praying to see You in our thoughts and in Your Word. Help us, Heavenly Father, as we look into the Scriptures to understand Your divine point of view, not just in the doctrinal framework of the Scripture, but also in the precepts and concepts uh, that mortar the Word of God together for our own edification, our own understanding. Help us to understand that this life is passing, and we are passing through it. And that we are all in a process under the second law of thermodynamics of, of getting older, though some of them are very young, still getting older, but hopefully, Father, getting wiser as we who have some years on us still need to search for more wisdom from your word. Thank you, Father, for giving us the ability to persevere. We ask now that you 
would continue to guide us, show us your mercy and grace, and use us for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, Revelation 22, 1 through 3. Much more importantly than what the city of God will look like is that you know for sure that you will be there one day. Because we've talked a fair amount about the heavenly city, Jerusalem. Somewhat, a little bit, about the new earth. Because more of it is about the city itself than it is the new earth. The kainos, as the word in the Greek means, which means fashioned from pre-existing materials. Not new totally out of a different realm, but fashioned from pre-existing materials, yet without sin. But more importantly, though, what we've been talking about than the city of God, again, which is what we've described more than anything else, is that it will for sure be your home one day. Morality, high as it may be, good deeds as well as they may be and and notable as they may be, the keeping of religious rituals and observances as stoic and aesthetic as they may be are still never enough to satisfy the just demands of a holy God upon a sinful people. Jesus is the only answer to that problem. Nothing else can solve that problem. And I repeat what I said last time regarding the words of our Lord when he said, you must be born again. Talking to Nicodemus, a Pharisee of the highest order who knew the law of Moses as well as anyone, perhaps also taught the law as well as Paul being a Pharisee, a teacher of the Pharisees would have later on. But he said, you must be born again. He did not say, you should be born again. Or that it would help to be born again. He did not say being a good member and standing in the Jewish and or even Christian community would make you born again. He said, you must be born again. He said, you must trust me as your Savior. And so my question is, have you trusted him as your Savior? Have you at some time in your life come empty-handed with nothing but faith in His power to save you as a sinner? And have you asked Him to do so? I pray that you have. Because heaven is not your destiny if you have not. Think about that. As we continue with this study, we see this messenger angel proceeded to show John more than who dwells in this city, which he's been talking about. But more descriptions of the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, and what life will be like there. We've seen the description and the size of the city in the preceding chapter, chapter 21, almost 1,400 cube miles. Some say 15, some say 1,380. But by the... The length of a furlong and the four square of it means it's cube shape, which is apparently almost 1400 miles cube with a 216 thick wall with the apostles names and the foundations and the tribes of Israel and the names of the doors and each door being a pearl and an angel at each door as well in a place only for believers. Non-believers will not be there. And I mention also that this is also the city for believers. This city is probably, I would believe, already complete. Has been. God doesn't have to spend time with us all and get an extension cord hooked up. He doesn't have to get a ruler or a measurement out to get everything laid out and planned out like we would as people because He's God. And I think it's a shame, though God humanizes Himself in a sense through the person of Jesus Christ, through the hypostatic union, God is God and we're not. And sometimes we just have to let God be God in our thinking and not wrestle with that and just embrace that and fall into that. It's like a child that's sloughing. You know, they've got that cry where they're, Mama, 
I got you. Mama says, oh, Daddy, even Daddy says, I got you. You'll be all right. Just, just, it'll be okay. And they hold you until you calm down. They can't get more Daddy or Mama than that, or Grandma and Granddaddy sometimes than that. Let them do that. And God does that same thing with us where we cry, Abba, Father. Sometimes that's the word we have to just accept God by faith. Not put him in a test tube. Not put a ruler and square and a slide rule as the old folks did back in the day. I'll tell you, before there was so many things that were digital and GPS oriented, you know, people relied on their intellect and their skills and their faith more than people do so much, I think, now than they do. But that's another story. But the description is given, those that shall not be there and those that shall be there, seen in verse uh, earlier verses in verse 24 of chapter 21. But there was a river, he showed me, in verse 22, in verse 1, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And he's talking about this city description. So this angel shows John this. A river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeds out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. This river is real. This is not a figurative river. It is a real river. And its source comes from the upper level, that is, where the throne of God is, and it runs through the city. Now that's a heck of a waterfall, 1,500 miles. So I say it navigates its way through in such a way because it's 15, almost, let's just say 1,500 miles wide, long, or deep, and high. With all of these wonderful things that are in it. covers almost a third of the United States in its size. And the Bible doesn't use similes in describing the city, whereas the Bible at times used similes to give a comparison or like as unto in some of the descriptions that were given of the works of the Antichrist and the destructions upon the earth during the second half of the seven-year tribulation period. No similes or figures of speech are used here. It is to be taken quite literally. And I began when I taught years ago the book of Revelation... I began with the first three messages before we got to the first verse and how to interpret the Scripture hermeneutically. How you are to study the Scripture and then how you are to explain it. And figures of speech was a part of that three-part lesson before we ever got to verse 1 of how to study the Scripture scientifically or hermeneutically. There's a science to it. It's not haphazard. It's not just by feeling. It's not about how I felt, I felt about that passage. First Peter says that there is no scripture or prophecy given of any private interpretation. God has a plan for it. That's why the Word of God says you are to rightly divide the Word of truth. Cut it straight. And so that's what we do. And so there are places in the Scripture when you're describing things from the Word of God that you just need to stay on point. <laughs> Don't elaborate too much. We have a tendency to do that, preachers do it, because we like to we like to yak. We like to talk. So I'm going to try to stop yakking and get on with it. The river is real. Its source comes from the upper level of the throne of God, and the river runs through the city, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. It also symbolizes, this river, it symbolizes the source of satisfaction. So you can have something that is real, yet it still has symbol. The flag that we have here is real, yet it also symbolizes something that's important. And this river symbolizes the source of satisfaction which we experience from God, that it comes from Him. It comes from His authority. His throne represents where His seat of authority resides. His seat of authority is not in Rome. It's in heaven. God has not turned it over to a man or men or women. He shares it with us. We're not to assume it or to take it or to snatch it away from the authority that God vested it in. So thirsting for God's salvation begins in time. 
And then that salvation must be received during your lifetime. But the soul will always long for refreshment from God, even in the eternal state, when there is sin and death no more. You will still long for refreshment and peace. Then you will know that it only comes through Christ, first of all, as in this life in salvation, and then the guaranteed eternal peace that continues to come from God when you're out of this old body and with the Lord. You will still seek him for your refreshment. This is what our Lord told the Samaritan woman at the well. He said, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I give unto him shall never thirst again. What's I'm talking about? Bios, but zoe, eternal satisfaction in the spirit realm. He says, but the water that I give him shall be him and him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. John 4:14. And all of us have trials in this life. But in the next life, we will have no rituals. We will have no trials and we will have no worries. The Dasani water brand has nothing on this water. This water is free and is most refreshing. Actually, the Greek reads here, Potamon, Katharon, Hudates, Zoes. Potable water, drinkable water, cleansing water. Hydrotas, water, power water, in other words. You heard of a hydrogen dam, you've got power there. This is powerful water. And the water in itself also is zoes water, Z-O-E-S. That's an eta, not an epsilon in the Greek. There's two E's there in the Greek. Zoes, this has to do with refreshing the spirit more so than refreshing the flesh. And yes, you will have a form of flesh, though perhaps, I don't believe, a carbon-based flesh as apparently Randy Alcorn does in his book, Heaven. If you've read that, it's a very eye-opening and very good book. But from his perspective in studying this passage of Scripture, he goes a bit too far because he gives the idea that you will die in heaven without water and food. You will never die again. You're not going to die again. I think he takes it, though he does an excellent job in many perspectives. His theology is not exactly on point on everything. I'm sure mine isn't either. But you have eternal life and you will never die, the Bible says. And the Bible doesn't say you have to drink and eat or you will die. But you can drink and eat for your enjoyment and your refreshment. And so I look forward to that. And we won't need a keto diet or anything like that to go with that. So that no Mediterranean, probably a Mediterranean diet, because, you know, that's where they're from. You know, <laughs> no, I don't know. But this water is pure and it, and it depicts eternal life. That's what the word means. Zoe, not bios. Refers not to sustaining biological life, though it is certainly drinkable and good stuff, not contaminated. And I have seen people have biological water quenched as you have when their physical thirst is, 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 is needs to be fulfilled, but yet they go back to their sinning. This is a eternal Refreshment. And I have seen men drink of the eternal waters from God, and it has forever changed their lives. I want you to remember regarding the deity of Jesus Christ that he too has a throne here at the right hand of the Father's throne. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, because the Lamb has a throne too. Jesus Christ has a throne. Revelation 3 and verse 21 tells us he has a throne. That means a seat of authority in heaven. That's why God could say, you shall have no other gods beside me in the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods beside me as mentioned in other places. But Jesus Christ is not a no other God. He's a manifestation of God in bodily form through the Incarnation. He was also the Jesus that walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. He's also the one that pulled the dirt together and breathed the Nephesh Kaya, the living life, into the nostrils of Adam and Eve. 
He was in theophanies or pre-incarnate forms through angels as the angel of the Lord at times in the Old Testament. And yes, I believe the Father did have a, 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 a talk, a talky talk, though. I believe he's the one that had the talky talk with Moses at the burning bush. Obviously, there's all three of the Spirit of God working. David, King David of Israel said, Lord, don't take your spirit from me because they were only endued with power, not indwelt with the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament uh, pneumatology or the Old Testament era, as we know. But eternal life flows from the, this throne, and only God offers this eternal life, and it's a constant reminder to all of us, and it will be then as well. We remember that. God doesn't let us forget it for some reason. Even with a sinless body, He doesn't let us forget it. There are some things that you should never forget. Your mama. <laughs> Hopefully your pappy too. But there are some things that some people seem to forget that should be so obvious, but people do. It not only galls me that people do forget, but that it could happen to me as well. But in verse 2, he says, in the midst of the street, now we're, we're, in the, we're inside the city now, we're not outside looking in, because we've been outside in the last verses looking in into the dimensions and all that, and all the beautiful things. The twelve different stones that make up the twelve platforms of the foundation and the twelve doors with the names of the twelve tribes of Israel all made with a single pearl representing the depiction of the suffering of Christ. But in the midst of the street of it, that is in this city, and on either side of the river there was this tree of life which bore twelve fruits and yielded her fruit every month and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. What? So in the midst of the street of the city and on either side of the river, there is the tree of life. This tree has a wide reach. This tree will bear 12 fruits. Doesn't say if these 12 fruits are born at 12 different times, one each month, or if it bears 12 fruits 12 months out of the year. Twelve different fruits. I'm just saying these represent sustenance to the Spirit. Though I, I think very well they are very edible. But it doesn't say anything about these things being loaded down with high fructose corn syrup. Stay away from that stuff. It's worse than dope. It is a dope almost. But this... Tree will bear twelve fruits and yield her fruit every month. That tells you another thing too. Because the Bible says in Genesis 8.22, as long as the earth exists, there shall be seasons and months. Think about that one. It will be an earth that will exist. Though it will be a new earth, but it will have months and it will have seasons. Hello. Do I get to keep my sled for sleigh riding? We'll go a little further. It will bear twelve fruits and yield her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. All right, God said as long as the earth remains, there will be seasons. Genesis 8 and verse 22. As long as the earth remains, there will be seasons. However, we do not know what that will be exactly like in the new earth. We just don't know. You can surmise. I can surmise. I just don't want to surmise when there's so much more I can learn. And I'll find out when I get there. Some people will say, I can't wait, I can't wait. Yeah, you can. You mean you want to die today? When people say, I can't wait, what does that mean? Does it mean you're impatient with living? I've said that before. I know what I'm talking about. I just need to be patient with living. We do not know exactly what the new earth will be like. We do not know. But we've got the city that's being described at this time. But we know there will be seasons, and the city will reside on the earth, and it will experience these seasons of the earth. Without climate change, without the second law of thermodynamics working against the earth as it does now with volcanoes, tsunamis, Hurricanes, tornadoes, 
all kinds of disruptions on the planet, severest of weather that you couldn't survive. God is not going to let there be uninhabitable parts of this new earth, from what I understand from Scripture. God's not going to have uninhabitable areas or large, vast areas. You may have lakes, as we will look at, because the river's got to go somewhere. And there are large lakes in the world, but freshwater lakes, not large air cleaning filters called oceans. That's what they are. They're basically the air filter, the cleanser of the earth. They're the big filter for pollution and everything else in the world. Not just from man, but from the earth itself and the atmosphere. We understand that. Living in a carbon-based world, you're going to have a lot of crud. You're going to have a lot. I mean, guess you know where our oil and gas comes from? Just dead organic matter. So we understand that. However, we do not know what that will exactly look like when it comes to the seasons in the new earth. This type of tree was found in the Garden of Eden, as Genesis 2.9 says. It was called the tree of life. And it was for sustaining biological life, not spiritual life. Because Adam and Eve weren't lost when they were at first in the Garden of Eden. They were just safe. They weren't redeemed. Not until they got saved. But that was only until after they sinned. But after Adam and Eve sinned, God drove them out of their paradise. He posted an angel to guard the tree of life so that they could not perpetually live in a state of sin. They would have to die to fulfill the mandate God put on disobedience. Genesis 3 and verse 22. This tree of life represented and provided physical immortality in that day. This tree of, of the first paradise, a paradise lost due to sin, is now forever found in the eternal paradise. And I will remind all of us here that eating will be a part of our resurrected, glorified life. I think I stuck that down as one of the questions. I guess I did. Yep, maybe. Oh, yeah. Even though eating is not necessary to sustain a carbonless, deathless body, eating will be enjoyed forever. Our Lord ate bread with His Emmaus disciples after the resurrection is seen in Luke 24 and verse 30. He wasn't a phantom, as the word in the original says there, or a ghost. He had a body that could be touched, hugged, bring it in, you know. Thomas, put your hand on my side. See, this is, this is not a phantom. He says, I am flesh. Touch me. So he ate bread with his Emmaus disciples. Maybe they had something on the side. A little peanut uh, apple butter to go with that. Then in Luke 24, verses 40 through 43, he ate honey and fish with his better known disciples, the 11 that were left. Also, at the beginning, once Jesus Christ kingdom age begins on the earth, I want to just, and we're backing up here, but when the millennial kingdom begins, there will be a wedding supper at the coronation of Jesus Christ when he begins his 1,000 year reign after his second coming, after the tribulation period is over. There's the church, there's the rapture of the church, there's the seven years where the church is in heaven, believers are in New Testament, believers are in heaven, receiving their judgments and evaluation of their life for reward and service and duty to follow. Duty to follow. Second Timothy 2 tells us that those who, who, uh, who suffer in His name, who live for the Lord, shall reign with Him. Reigning would mean that you have subjects, people that you will help give guidance and service and help to in the name of the Lord. And you will come back in His second coming with Him. And the second coming, that's seven years after the rapture, and he will destroy those wicked people upon the earth. And the only people that will be left will be saved people, people who got saved during the tribulation period. And they will begin their progeny for a thousand years of their children, children's children, such and so forth, during that time. And Jesus Christ will reign. He's going to have King David as his prince, 
ruling in Jerusalem. But Jesus will rule the whole world, but he will use those faithful believers in time, both Old and New Testament, to be his witnesses throughout the world during that time, judges on supreme seats, rulers in supreme areas, teachers in the places all over the world, giving them knowledge to and fro of the things of the Lord. Well, the lion during that time will also lay down with the lamb. People will be able to live for hundreds of years as the promise of God given. The salt sea will not be the dead sea any longer. It will be flourishing with fish. The desert barren area will be filled and fruit trees will grow on it. God is going to ecologically change the earth during the thousand year reign of Christ on this earth. And when that whole era begins... Of those who are in the flesh yet who survived the tribulation period who are again only saved, there will also be the intermingling of God's Christ servants on the earth in resurrected glorified bodies who will be serving the Lord all over the earth during that time. That is a covenant that God made with Abraham that is an unconditional covenant. And that Abrahamic covenant fulfilling of God's promise to Abraham, it was not based upon Abraham doing anything other than agreeing with God there when that covenant was made. And when that covenant was made, God made a guarantee based on the integrity of his own word to keep his word to Abraham that they would have a nation that would be the head of the nations, not the tail end. That they would live in a nation that there would be a free from war and they could beat their plowshares into whatever and their pruning hooks into whatever, swords into pruning hooks, that they could go about the agricultural lifestyle. They could live a prosperous life during that time without threat of their enemies. They'll have a thousand years of that while Satan is cast down into the bottomless pit for that thousand years. That's all literal scripture. You know, the Christian who believes the Bible has got a lot to look forward to, don't they? But the Christian who does not believe the Bible really has a gloom outlook on the future. It really has a gloom outlook on the future. But when you know the Word of God, you've got a bright outlook on the future. You need that. I need that. You've got people down here on this earth who call themselves Christians, got the longest faces I've ever seen in my life for people who are born again and headed for the glory land. You think they then died and not gone to heaven, but to hell. It's ridiculous. There's a thousand year reign of Christ. And when that reign begins, there's going to be the wedding supper. The wedding ceremony of Christ in the church, or the bride and the groom, will take place in the heavenlies. With the Father presiding. This is after all of our works have been tried and proven. And we're wearing our white robes of righteousness, as it were. And there, there is the consummation of that great forever being with the Lord in His service, but in His devotion to you in such a way that has no barrier of imperfection. It will all be taken away. Though positionally it is now, we know that we're not perfect in our practice at times. But when He comes back and establishes His kingdom, which is the 24th Psalm, 21st Psalm is His suffering, 22nd Psalm is um, uh, excuse me, 22nd Psalm is his suffering, 23rd Psalm is the Lord's, uh, as my shepherd. That's the, the working shepherd and the, the serving shepherd, the, the, uh, providing, feeding, fostering shepherd. The 24th Psalm is his magnificent triumph and the choir, the chorus singing as he comes into his kingdom. When that happens, He's going to send his servants out into the, get me there here now, into the highways and byways to compel the people to come in. A passage often used for church members to grab anyone and anything that's alive, that's got breath, and get them into the church. That's not a New Testament church age. That is a kingdom age passage. has to do with the millennial kingdom of those that you invite into the supper of the Lamb in celebration of the of his marriage to the bride and the coronation as he begins as the king of kings and lord to lord on the earth for a thousand years for that kingdom reign. And yes, during that time, food will be a part of our life. And in the eternal state, when the new heaven and the new earth is, and the new city, 
that will also, I think, believe, be a part of our future. And it will be a pleasure to be eternally vibrant and healthy and to eat if we want to and not have to take a pill or some sort of a Tums after we get finished eating. What the fruits of the tree of life taste like, we do not know. But we will know when we get to heaven. The appetites, and I'm going to say this, the appetites of the flesh, because we, we're already doing that now. The appetites of the flesh will not overwhelm the appetites of the spirit. I'm afraid that too often happens to us as people. That the appetite of the flesh so often overwhelms the appetites of the spirit and the soul. But in eternity that will not be the case. We will not live to eat. We will eat to live. But it's spiritual speaking. Some people live to eat, not eat to live. We won't really need to do either one. But in the spiritual realm, we need to understand a few things. Uh, as it is in heaven, let it so be here on earth. Remember the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, among believers, it certainly should be prominent in our thinking that His will in heaven should be done as His will on earth. And when we get into the new heaven and the new earth the most important emphasis will be in our spiritual life, not our physical life. Yes, we need to eat now. That's no lie about that. But we have to. We should watch it. But it should not overwhelm us. It should not control us. This tree will bear 12 kinds of fruit. You say, well, I'm a casserole kind of lady. Is there any casseroles? Well, it doesn't say there isn't. Just like it doesn't say there isn't dogs or cats or birds. Most likely there will be. And I'm not talking about the millennial state. I believe for sure there will be then, but also in the eternal state. You might have a pet Tyrannosaurus for all I know on a leash out there. Whether there is a different fruit for every 12 months or it bears 12 kinds of fruit at a time each month, no one knows. Our brains will be deprogrammed and reprogrammed into the new body to eat healthy and to respect our bodies as the temple of the Lord He intended them to be at that day. I will tell us that. What do you mean? Because you are going to forget those things which are past. What? <laughs> After the judgment seat of Christ, there's no need to dwell on the past. There's no need to have remorse. There's no need to feel sorry for those who might not show up or who might not be at that table, who might not be in the eternal state because they did not receive Christ. They may have gone along to get along in the Christian realm, but never received Christ as their Savior. You may think that I've got to have high fructose corn syrup, or I've got to have that rich syrup to put on my pancakes. And the Lord's telling you, you don't need that for that. I've got to have this. I've got to have at least six grams of coffee within the 15, first 15 minutes of my waking up in this world. And the Lord's going to tell you, no, you don't. That's a physical exaggeration. You don't have to have that. People who are believers who've gotten hooked on drugs, and some really do need some, <laughs> I wouldn't deny them, won't have that desire anymore. The brain's going to be rewired for eternity, people, you'll think, how am I going to make it? Don't think within the physical realm when you think about these things. And it is hard to do because that's all we know. But we're, to, we're asked to take it by faith that the Lord is going to change things for us. But we don't know all there is. The water of life which proceeds from the throne of God and of the Lamb and the fruits of the tree of life. And the word there for tree of life is one tree. That must be a whale of a tree. It's just singular, one tree. Now I want you to note, it's 1,500 miles from down here to up there. So the river runs through it. This tree, what is there a river? Is something that carries that fruit up and down that river? How huge is this tree? It covers both sides. Remember, it's 1,500 miles. 
This tree, I don't know what it is about it, but it's huge apparently. Whatever it is, as literal as it may be, it's in the singular. Only thing I can do to try to give an accurate description is to use the original language which the Holy Spirit chose to use for this word. And he chose to use it in the form that he chose to use it in. And so when I say I believe in the inspiration of Scripture, I believe in the inspiration of Scripture. That's the only authority I have to stand on. Not subjection, not conjecture, or anything else, or opinion. I have to go by that. I have to believe by faith by that. And then the water of life, as I said, which proceeds from the throne of God and of the Lamb and the fruits of the tree, which spans across both sides of this river, apparently. It doesn't say how wide or big the river is. It just it runs the length of it. But also it says it has healing leaves. And I believe that these are a reminder that all life finds its health or source in God. The word here for healing is our word therapon or therapy. Therapion. T-H-E-R-A-P-E-I-A-N, therapian, therapy for healing. You know, we all need therapy. (laughs) I'm not being facetious. The leaf of the tree actually enhances enjoyment. That's the way I see it, and some others see it that way, that there is an enhancement of enjoyment in the leaf itself, perhaps. You know, the Bible says the little wine makes the heart merry. Well, God knows that. A little wine makes the heart merry. Too much makes the head big, fat, hurt. But a little, the leaf of the tree actually says it enhances enjoyment, perhaps for the eternal blessings of a new kind of body. Because you're going to get a different kind of body. But a recognizable body. Recognizable. And that leaf of healing or whatever is not for correcting some sort of a breakdown that might happen to the resurrected body, as that cannot happen, but to only to enhance enjoyment for some reason, some way, perhaps literally, not just figuratively. These will be a reminder that all sustenance is in Christ. A reminder that healing of our souls comes from God. Though they are real, they also represent the truth that all life resides in God. So verse 3 says them, for, and there shall be no more curse. That's right. Death. There shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. All of the curses upon man in creation, of course, will be gone. You can go back to Genesis and it tells you what those curses are. There are curses upon the man. There are curses upon the woman. There are curses upon our habitation, entitled or called the earth. These are curses. No amount of government can change these curses. Climate change is a part of the curse of the sin of man. No one wants to call it sin anymore. Sin is the reason why the world is in the shape it's in. And the sin is the reason why the storms come the way they do. Though those storms may not be directed as God's wrath upon any particular group of people, the storms are a result of the curse on the earth. The habitation of which Adam and Eve were given is cursed because of Adam and Eve. wasn't cursed before, not least in this manner. So again, the second law of thermodynamics is at work. And Romans chapter 8 teaches that the earth is groaning within itself, awaiting its own redemption one day from the curse. That will be gone. No more hurricanes. No more tornadoes, no more cyclones, no more tsunamis, no more deserts, no more disease, no more severe cold, no more extreme heat. No more radon gas, (laughs) whatever else. 
that will all be gone. God's justice handed down the curses on man and earth due to sin. Genesis 3, 14 through 18. God put a curse on man and He put a curse on woman. Nowadays, our government is trying to take the curse that God put on man and put it on the woman. You don't see the curses of the woman put on the man, but you're constantly seeing men and stupid women trying to put that very same curse on women. God put a curse on the woman. And He put a curse on the man because of sin. And He gave us the grace to bear that curse. And He gave us a Redeemer to take the curse of sin away from us, though we still bear the bodily suffering of being a human being on this earth. God's justice also handed down the curse upon our sin and put it on Jesus Christ and imputed it to Him. Galatians 3, verse 13. I find it interesting to see that we are summing up the last book and the last chapter of the Bible of the book of Revelation by being reminded of our beginnings as human beings. There we see our complete failure as mankind to find happiness and joy apart from God's finished work. The grace of God is amazing in that He looked down on mankind, had pity and compassion on us, and offered the only plan to redeem us. He sent Jesus Christ His Son, knowing men would crucify Him on the cross of Calvary. He saved us knowing we would sin many times before we left this earth, even as believers. But He keeps us instead. Sinning will not cease until we die. You say, well, I haven't sinned in 20 years. Well, you're a liar. or You're too dumb to know what sin is. There are 28 different known mental attitude sins that would damn you as quick as adultery would. What? Seriously? Yeah. You're not going to get away with that type of thinking. I can't help it. I know, but it condemns you that you thought it. We don't see the curse of that. The fact that you thought that and that mean anything by it still proves that you have within your being a beast, a demon as it were, but not a demon. It is called the old sin nature. You have a beast within you that condemns you. And to deny that is part of the work of the old sin nature to lead you to think that I'm all that in a can of corn. She's bad. She's worse than I am. No. Everybody stinks. And I can spot a mile off a person who thinks that they don't stink. We all do. We don't have to dwell on it, but it's true. Sinning will not cease until we die. Though you may be in great shape, rarely have to ever make a confession in your private prayers to God, because that's where they really are supposed to be. Unless you've offended somebody then you need to go to them. But I mean, other than that, things that you might say, whatever, things that you might do, or things that you dwell on, things that you've got going on in your head. And there are so many things that you may not think that are sin that are in God's eyes. They are the manifestations of the sin nature. Our sinning as Christians will not cease until we are dead. Then there will be sin no more. Even the unbeliever will never sin again after they're dead. Yes, we are to obey God. We are to submit to His Word. Psalm 119.11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against Thee. And that helps us to consistently live a life where we're not practicing sinning against Him and His Spirit within us. And following this faithful practice positions the believers for living a godly life. But we still will sin from time to time until we're dead. And we know that this grieves us and God. But I will be so happy when the day comes when I can look at myself and not despise the sinner that I am. I will look forward to that day when I will not be ashamed of myself from time to time. Now, I think if we're all honest with ourselves, we will say, I think I'm, I can be a better version of myself, as they say, than what I really am. And we can be honest with ourselves. You don't have to tell nobody else. That's why we don't have aisle running in here. Your sin is nobody else's business in this church. And we're not going to make a show of your sin. It's nobody else's business if you sin. 
But it certainly is God's business. That's your family's business if it's family business. The more people glorify their open confession of their sins, the more other people want to know what they did. And people aren't focusing on Jesus Christ and the Word of God. Their focus is on the gory dirt that this man or this woman did. The next time they see him in the assembly, I wonder if she's still running around on him. I wonder if he's still stealing from his employer. That kind of stuff goes on. When churches don't focus on truth rather than on the problems that people have. The Apostle Paul had it right when he said, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin, Romans 7, 24 and 25. So death is not to be feared by a believer. Last paragraph. Death is not to be feared by believers. There shall be no more curse. Unless we are the rapture generation, that is, the ones when Christ comes back and ends the church age, unless we are the rapture generation, fearlessness is the only way we can start to enjoy our eternal blessings. That's right. What must we be now in order to begin enjoying eternal blessings? Fearless. Well, there are a lot of Christians who don't enjoy being a Christian because they're so fearful of so many things. Both now and what they might face in the future. Look, be in Christ, be in grace, be in fellowship, and you'll be all right. God will take care of everything else. Paul said in Philippians 1.21, For me to live Christ, to die, gain. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in this city, and His servants will serve Him as we close. And the word here for servants, of course, you know the common word douloi. Doulos is one of the forms. And it means a bond slave. You're bound to your master. But it's through His shed blood that you're bound to Him. But you're also bound to heaven, not hell. You're bound to joy, not eternal sadness. You're bound to light, not darkness. You're bound to friendships and love and laughter forever. Not loneliness and isolation, which hell is a place of darkness forever. The blackness of darkness forever is one of the descriptions of hell. This is the same word, servants, or douloi, that John used in Revelation 1.1. All believers in Christ are His bond servants. Yes, we are God's children by faith in Christ, but we are also His servants. We need to understand that. We shall serve Him, it says. We shall serve Him. Now, some Christians have a hard time serving the Lord now. I mean, born-again Christians have a hard time serving, that is, doing what the Lord wants them to do now. Because there's the resistance. Uh Uh-huh. The resistance. We shall serve him. Future, active, subject of the verb, produces the action, indicative mood, no element of doubt. We shall serve him. The word serve is important. We shall serve him. La truo is the word. The usage of the word servants relates more to a hired servant. Now, a hired servant, we shall serve him. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in and his servants shall la truo, shall serve him. Our service will be rewarded. A hired servant was rewarded. Our service will be one where we will be given honorarium to be a part of worshiping God. The joy of being near God will be fantastic. Today, it seems like the way it is in Christianity, it's not fantastic worshiping God. And I'm not talking about, you know, a rock concert so-so of worshiping God. That's their business. I don't go for it, but that's their business. I'm more or less worshiping the flesh is what I can see. 
the thump thump, as they called it on Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> Where's the thump thump? <laughs> Just as jar of dirt, you no know, want it. <laughs> but the joy of being near God will be fantastic. More so than it is now, because right now there's either fear that holds us back or fear of losing our independence. Our sin nature is repulsed in its own self. You, you may not be, but that nature in you and I, if it's let out of the bag, is repulsed by doing anything for anyone. Lots of the time. But in the day when we are with the Lord with no sin nature, and in that environment... Of course, obviously after death, we have no more sinful nature. There is no more opposition to correction. There is no more resistance to the will of God. I mean, that's, that's, it's amazing to think about that. There's a time coming when you will think not once about what anybody will think around you to drop to your knees and praise God for what He's doing for you. There won't be, you're like, you're going to be like a, an innocent child again in, in an adult body. So am I. We will have no sin nature and we will be serving at the highest honor and joy to which we could attain and we will never hesitate doing it again. There will be no hesitancy. When God says, could I have some volunteers to help do this around the church? They'll knock you down to get there. But now it's, I don't know, I've got this going on. I've got, I got, I got to get that going on. I, 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 will I have, can I get some help around the temple here? I, I, I don't know, Lord. I, 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 I got a, a program I need to see. I, I got to go take care of something. That, none of that's going to happen there. Nowadays, that's kind of like the norm. Now everybody has to check their schedule now. You won't have to check your schedule in. It's okay. You got an open schedule. What time you got there? I don't know. And the Lord says, I'll get her back around to it. He'll get back around to it. You're not going nowhere. And now, even in the flesh, nowadays, as far as God's concerned, you're not going nowhere. He got you right where He wants you. That's good. But we will never hesitate again. I'm not talking pie in the sky stuff. I'm talking about as we see things, as the text lays it out. We will not be robots for God. Don't get me wrong here. I want you to understand this. You're not going to be some automaton or some robot for God, which we're not supposed to be now. You're not going to be a robot for God. It's just the potential for sinning will never come up again. The potential for putting God off will never come up again. The need for faith will never come up again. We will be in agreement with God as it was meant to be in the beginning. Before sin was a part of our DNA, our makeup. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this day and for the blessings in life and for your kindness to us. Thank you for the word and the truth that you share with us. Thank you for the blessings of this day. Thank you for doing for us what we could never have done for ourselves and sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins to give us eternal life. Father, we love you. Jesus Christ, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you for what you do. Father, we thank you for all the many blessings that you give to us, our friends in Christ the challenges that we have as being witnesses. We thank you for that. We even thank you for the physical suffering that we may be enduring today that it might through some means draw us closer to you. We thank you for the victories you've given us. We thank you for the praises we have for you for giving us the freedoms that we have. We thank you for giving us the liberties that we have. We thank you for giving the wisdom and how to deal and to handle those liberties that we have as Christians. And we thank you now for our brothers and sisters and the Lord, not just in this present building today, but in America and everywhere in the world. We pray for those who are being persecuted for Christ's name's sake. That they will stick with their faith, stick with their witness, and that you would reward them handsomely one day for all eternity. Thank you now, Father, for all you do for us. 
In Jesus Christ's name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen.